this seminar, you, you could say it's about a, a phenomenon that just a decade ago was almost never heard of, uh, at least not in more traditional evangelical circles. Um, uh, it's a phenomenon that has to do with a new way of thinking, uh, not so much about sexuality actually, but, but even more about sexual identity. Um, uh, it has sometimes been uh, described as transgenderism, uh, sometimes as queer theory. Uh, and, and those two labels uh, have a slightly different meaning, and I will try to, to, to show that, uh, but they also go into one another. Uh, so the purpose of this seminar is it's to, to present some of the central ideas uh, of uh, the ideology that has evolved around those two labels, you could say, uh, and also to analyze them from a biblical point of view. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and I will also give you some specific examples from several nations, but not least my own country, Sweden, uh, uh, where this ideology has gotten a strong status. Um, and, and I myself, I encountered this um, new way of thinking uh, when I uh, read a report about the latest school materials for uh, Swedish sexual education. Uh, I was part of a network producing that report, and, and there were several things that struck me when I read it, and I have written some here. Uh, consistently, these materials presented sex uh, primarily uh, as an individualistic phenomenon, uh, and that means that they never mentioned stable and loving relationships as a natural context for sex. That was not even mentioned in those materials for public school. Uh, None of the four materials uh, mention that you can have sex within a marriage. And that is also an interesting thing just to note. It, it never occurred during those pages that sex could be an activity within a marriage. Uh, there was no information whatsoever about how to build a strong and lasting relationship. Uh, but one material <laughs> gave instructions about how to do when you would want to leave a relationship. That's also quite telling. Uh, uh, three out of four materials, and this is also very spectacular, I think, uh, chose not to talk at all about the biological side of sex, uh, nothing of the possibility of getting pregnant uh, or issues surrounding that experience. Uh, so all in all, sex was removed from the context of marriage, of stable relationships, and of pregnancy. Uh, that is quite an achievement, I would say. Uh, so what did you learn instead uh, through this? Well, uh, one thing that was very much pushed forward in these materials uh, was what in Sweden at least is called norm-critical pedagogy. I don't know exactly what, what you would say in other parts of the world, but that is the, the standard phrase in Sweden and it's used very widely nowadays. Uh, and in one of the materials it was expressed this way. Despite information and legislation, the heteronorm is still fortified in society. One is presumed to be he heterosexual until one openly show or tell that one has a different sexual orientation. Parents may presuppose that their children grow up to form heterosexual core families. Uh, big exclamation mark after that one. Um, another uh, material shared its concerns this way. There is still a strongly dominating mindset in society concerning how one should be and how one should live. Uh, it is often presumed that you should love someone of the other sex and want to form a family consisting of mother, father and child. It is often called the heteronorm. Uh, yet another material. Uh, uh, made basically the same point now re with a reference uh, to the animal world. Sometimes it is said that there is a kind of sexuality that is more biologically natural than another. But through studies of higher standing animals, and particularly one our closest relatives among the anthropoid apes, one has found that they are acting out their sexuality toward their own as well as the opposite sex. And then on another page they post the question, is it at all desirable to be normal? <laughs> Uh, you're starting to, to get the idea here. Um, and these statements made me curious uh, because there are some common threads here. Uh, one being the critique of the heteronorm um, and another being the overall critique of wanting to be normal. Uh, 
uh, or even the concept of normality as something that exists altogether. Um, uh, and, and it was when I sort of started to scratch uh, a bit on the surface of these words uh, that I came across uh, what is called queer theory. Uh, and I can just make a, a brief historical uh, overview here. Um, the, the women's movement that was formed, uh, well, in the end of the 19th century, uh, uh, that movement fighted for equal rights uh, for men and women um, uh, to, have, to have the same rights, uh, for instance, concerning the, the right to vote in public elections. Uh, but, but there was an obvious starting point here, and that is that men and women are uh, different but equal. <laughs> uh, we are different, but we should have equal rights. Uh, that is, our biology, our gender roles differ, uh, but we should still be treated uh, in a similar way uh, with the same human rights. Uh, and this was also a movement that engaged a lot of people within the Christian church, and, and many would say that the revival movements were a strong part of this movement as they had, uh, for instance, the right to vote within the congregation. Most of them had had that for a long time and, and was part of this first wave, you could say, of feminism that is rather called the women's movement. Uh, but then we had the second wave uh, of feminism uh, and that evolved in the 1960s. Uh, they introduced a concept of uh, gender roles as primarily a social construct. Um, so so um, they would say that the biological sex uh, is a fixed entity, um, but uh, the social consequences of our sex uh, have a very strong uh, connection with, with society around and the culture around. Uh, this was quite a radical movement uh, in its time. Uh, at least in Sweden, I would say most Christians would agree on the basic idea of this that your biological sex is sort of fixed, but the gender roles do differ and they are uh, related very much to culture. Um, you could take that idea far or not so far, but, but, but the basic assumption there would, would be agreed upon on by most Christians in Sweden. Now, when we talk about queer theater, we need to realize that that is one step further than this. Uh, it's sometimes even called the third wave of feminism uh, but but I, I use the word queer theory. Uh, what queer theory is, is telling us is that not only our gender roles, but also our biological sex uh, is to be perceived as a social construct. Um, and that is radical. I think we all see that. Uh, so one has basically declared war on all the ways of connecting uh, the word normal to our talk about sexuality. There is no given sort of standard uh, set here, but, but, but uh, everything is really fluid. Um, and uh, for, uh, for people who, who, who adhere to, to queer theory, uh, there is no such thing as normal sexuality. Uh, rather, our sexuality is perceived as fluent, uh, and, and therefore uh, one can oppose all the traditional norms um, uh, in this area. Uh, the heteronorm I have already mentioned. Uh, and the heteronorm is really the saying that the majority of the population is heterosexual and should be expected to be just that. Um, so, so the basic assumption that this is something given for, for the majority of the population, that is the heteronorm. Uh, queer theory opposes that idea. Uh, it also opposes the, the norm of bin being, uh, binary, binary opposites, uh, telling us that humanity for the most part uh, is consisting of women and men, uh, and that that is as it should be. It's not just a coincidence, it's, it's actually a specific meaning with this, uh, the, the binarity in, in, uh, in humanity. Uh, and and uh, anyone who holds to a more traditional view uh, on this subject would uh, probably think that this is quite an extreme ideology. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is that this way of thinking has made a strong impact uh, already in the international uh, LGBTQ movement. Uh, and uh, I, I know that this is a bit different in different countries, but, but in quite a few countries about a decade ago, uh, 
there was a big discussion within the LGBTQ movement uh, about which strategy uh, one should use uh, to advance LGBTQ rights. Uh, and actually that was when the Q was added <laughs> to that sentence. It started rather with LGB and then you had LGBT and then there was LGBTQ. And nowadays you would also add the I for intersex. Uh, and there are many other letters too, but, but these are the most common. Uh, but in this discussion within this, at that time, LGBT movement, uh, there was one camp uh, inspired by queer ideology, uh, and on the other side, a more traditional uh, gay movement, uh, because um, uh, those were the people who had been fighting for gay rights, uh, such as the right to marry, uh, the right to adopt children, um, the queer ideologists, they basically accused the gay rights people for having a too narrow agenda. Um, because they in some way even confirmed the heteronorm by uh, fighting to have the same privileges as the heterosexual part of the population, if you get the idea. Uh, so when the gay movement said, we want the same rights as the heterosexuals, the queer people said, hey, then you're just confirming the heteronorm. We want to crash all those norms, uh, erase them. Um, and um, uh, they say that the, the f all fixed labels, basically, when it comes to sexuality, are contraproductive uh, because their vision of true freedom uh, for sexual minorities, that was that no one should be able to call himself or herself normal. Uh, and also that the way to fight uh, hostility and discrimination in this area, uh, and then specifically towards sexual minorities, um, uh, the strategy to achieve that is to say that everything is equal to, to the other. Everything is as normal as the other. Uh, because uh, only then there is no longer a ground for discriminatory behavior. Um, if, if nothing is more normal or whatever uh, than the other, then we, we can't discriminate one another. So it's, it's a new paradigm, a new strategy for, for that. Um, and as you might have guessed, it's the queer ideologists that, that sort of won favor in these debates, uh, at least in, in big parts of the Western LGBTQ uh, movement. Um, which also means that what I'm talking about today with, with queer ideology and, and trans ideology is not embraced at all by all uh, within this movement. But, but uh, uh, the, the, the ones that have sort of the, the, uh, uh, the upper hand <laughs> uh, in, 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 this, uh, in the debates would be the queer ideologists. Uh, so that was just like an introduction into to this uh, subject. I haven't said much about trans or transgender yet, uh, but um, uh, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll save it a bit for later. Uh, but, but already now I think it's quite obvious uh, why this kind of identity has become uh, so important also in connection with uh, queer theory. Uh, because if you take the word transgender, uh, that means to have a gender identity that doesn't correspond to one's biological sex, uh, at least not as it was assigned as birth. Um, uh, it could also be that you live in such a way uh, as not to conform to uh, gender norms or roles in society. Um, uh, and this, you could say, supports the queer ideology, that is, uh, the idea that our sexuality is something fluid. Uh, that there are no given starting points when it comes to sexuality or sexual identity. Uh, so they are um, same, same, but different. We'll get back to that one. Um, but this also, I think, that could be important to say, that, that this means that neither queer nor trans is specifically about sexual promiscuity. Uh, we can have that idea of, of, of all these sort of sexual issues about, being, about promiscuity, I would not say that these issues primarily relate to that, although that could, of course, be one part of it. Um, but the, the core idea here is that everyone should be free to define uh, his or her sex and sexual orientation. Um, and this should also be without any necessary reference to your uh, 
biological prerequisites. Um, so, so the transgender uh, population, uh, you could say that they embody a new kind of ideal. And I also think that's why the trans uh, population have been such an important part of this cultural debate. Uh, because you could even call this a new salvation message. Uh, you can be whoever you want. Uh, you don't need to conform. Uh, you can rise above creation itself. Uh, define yourself as you want. That is the, the basic idea here. And uh, those of you who have read Genesis 3 know that this is, this is not a new concept. Uh, the wish to be your own master and to define everything on your own terms or your own initiative that comes in many shapes and forms. And, and I would say this is one of them to make a theological analysis of this. Um, but this has made the transgender people a bit of, of the heroes of our culture. Um, uh, sometimes willingly, sometimes not so willingly. Uh, but we have people like Conchita Wurst. Uh, some may remember him or her, the drag queen who won the Eurovision Song Contest in Copenhagen, uh, 2014. Um, someone who also embodies a new kind of ideal, a new kind of freedom concept. Uh, we have in America, we have Caitlyn Jenner, uh, who was an Olympic gold medal athlete, uh, named Bruce, Bruce Jenner, but changed into Caitlyn in 2015. And that was a huge thing in the media and also a symbolic personality in, in that whole context. Um, a question to me when I read about these things and, and try to analyze is, is how could these ideologies, since they are quite extreme uh, compared to just one or two decades ago, uh, how could they become mainstream in such a short period of time? Um, uh, and as I said, I will return to the issue of, of trans, uh, but, but both when it comes to queer and trans, uh, I think the key to understand what's going on here is the concept of intersectionality. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that uh, word and, and concept, intersectionality. Uh, uh, you can go to different sources to, to learn about that. I, I chose Wikipedia because it's simple. Um, it defines intersectionality as an analytic tool which attempts to identify how interlocking systems of power impact those who are most marginalized in society. Uh, intersectionality considers that the various aspects of humanity, such as class, race, sexual orientation, disability, and gender, do not exist separately from each other, but are complexly interwoven. Uh, and the point here is that uh, marginalization counts in many shapes, and that many of these cooperate to create hierarchies, uh, for good and for bad, uh, so in this way of thinking, if you are a male, you are privileged compared to women. Uh, if you are white, you are privileged compared to people with color skin. Uh, if you are a heterosexual, you are privileged compared to homosexuals uh, and so forth. You can go, of course, on and on in that. Uh, but uh, this means that a white heterosexual middle-aged man is on top of the ladder, uh, while, for instance, a black homosexual woman would be rather at the bottom. Uh, and when you combine this, uh, because this is originally uh, an ideology originating much in, in the Marxist way of thinking and, and postmodern way of thinking, uh, which holds that the issue of power um, is really the, the, the important issue. Uh, and it's much more important than the issue of truth. Uh, so so um, uh, since power is more important than truth, you get this power analysis and see, okay, where are you on the power scale? And if you, in that scale, hold to a lot of power, that works the other way. Then you are someone you should not listen to because there is a suspicion here uh, towards power. So from a strict power analysis, the white heterosexual middle-aged man is perceived as an oppressor, uh, while the black homosexual woman is perceived uh, as a representative of those who are oppressed. Uh, so it doesn't really matter if the white heterosexual man is making a good point in his way of presenting his view, whatever that may be about. Uh, because uh, um, uh, if the black homosexual woman disagrees, uh, 
she's the one that will be listened to, quite simply. Uh, not because she, in this case, have, has, has maybe better arguments, uh, but because she is perceived as a voice from the margin. Um, and I think uh, this is very important for us to understand how these things can, can be such rapid moves. Um, uh, the postmodern culture is, you could even say, obsessed with minorities. And there is a positive aspect of this, because also as Christians we should care for the marginalized. Uh, so I'm not saying this is altogether bad, uh, but when, when you get this system of intersectionality, it's, it sort of lives a, lives on it, it lives a life on its own. Um, because since the postmodern culture is obsessed with minorities, uh, and especially then with minorities that are perceived as oppressed. Interestingly enough, Christians are never <laughs> perceived as oppressed in this way of thinking, although we normally are a minority in the West at least. Uh, but it doesn't work that way, um, interestingly enough. Um, but uh, who can be more marginalized than a sexual minority such as the transgendered? It's quite obvious that in this power analysis, they may not have the best arguments, but when it comes to intersectionality, they have the best sort of uh, standing point. Uh, so they, they represent a movement that will have a disproportionately strong impact on society as a whole. Um, and and uh, you could just show it like this. Uh, the transgender population uh, fits into a larger narrative. Uh, that is the narrative first of radical individualism everyone defining him or herself. Um, the, the vision of man as the master of creation, even his or her own body, I can define anything, I can define even who I am, even what I am born like. Uh, and then, of course, this last perspective, that this is uh, uh, a minority that has, an, uh, has been underprivileged. Um, and therefore should be listened to. Uh, so I would say this is an important uh, explanation uh, to why uh, this uh, development has been so rapid. Uh, and I don't think we can understand it apart from, from, from uh, the theory or the idea of intersectionality. Are you with me so far? Um, because then I, I could return to, to the issue of, of trans. Um, I have already mentioned uh, that, that queer theory is a view of sexuality as something fluid. Uh, so you can go back and forth in queer theory on a scale. You could be a heterosexual, you could be a homosexual, bisexual, transsexual, and then go back. And, and you shouldn't really stop anywhere necessarily. It's what you feel like if you are a radical queer uh, ideologist. Um, Transgender is not exactly that. It's rather a metaphysical definition of sex. Uh, if you are transgender, you generally identify yourself uh, with the other biological sex. Uh, so you may be heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual or pansexual, polysexual, asexual. Uh, there are lots of them. Um, but uh, at least the point is that in your mind, you perceive yourself as something else than the sex that you were assigned with at, at birth. Um, so, so really that is another ideology, although they have some, some uh, things in common. Uh, your sex is defined in a way that is detached from your body, your reproductive organs, uh, your chromosomes, and normally also your hormones. Um, and this is interesting because this has caused a, a quite uh, big clash between uh, the transgender movement and the traditional feminist movement. Because the idea of the feminist movement, obviously, is that we should specifically guard the rights of women. But with this definition of sex, that is, or gender, that, that is not really uh, okay. Because uh, the trans activists would say that, hey, the women's movement, you discriminate on us. Uh, you are the privileged group and we are the underprivileged group. Uh, and um, there's been quite a big clash in, in the UK, you know, and, and there is also going on quite a big battle actually in, in Sweden uh, around this. And it's interesting to see because what we also see here is that, that these ideologies don't combine as easily as, as they have maybe uh, 
uh, said before that they, they should be able to do. Um, to, to, to be fair uh, about this issue of, of trends, you must say that um, trends could, could count for different things. There is a very small part of the population. Uh, in most statistics, it would be between 1 in 5,000, which is a high number, or just 1 in 30,000. And sometimes it differs also between men and women, uh, who would sort of be, uh, be people that could get the diagnosis uh, that nowadays is called gender dysphoria. Uh, and I just uh, took the, the criteria here from uh, DSM, uh, a widely spread manual for, for mental disorders. And they have six points, and, and apparently it's just two of them that are needed to, to get this uh, diagnosis. Uh, it's a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and primary and or secondary sex characteristics. Big words, uh, but you see it on the screen too. A strong desire to be rid of one's primary or, and or secondary sex characteristics. A strong desire for the primary and or secondary sex characteristics of the other gender. A strong desire to be of the other gender. A strong desire to be treated as the other gender. And finally, a strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender. Uh, now, all these six are not needed to get this diagnosis, but uh, at least two, and, and normally I think it would be, be more. This is quite a, a big uh, uh, process to go through if, if you get that diagnosis. And my basic view here is that the church really should uh, treat the people who get this diagnosis um, uh, with, with much respect. Uh, I don't have all the answers and I didn't really plan to, to go into that issue. We could, if you want, to, to ask questions later um, uh, how we should relate to those with, with the uh, diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Um, because there are definitely uh, good reasons to think that something has happened Due, before birth or, or very early, at a very early stage in, in this little minority. Um, but um, uh, my main point here is that when we talk about uh, transgender or the trans movement, we are not only talking about this group. Uh, I would say we don't even primarily talk about this group uh, because um, uh, the, the, the label trans today is used much more broadly. Um, and uh, I have actually had contact with, with uh, one representative for, for those who call themselves medically uh, transgendered in Sweden. Their, their, uh, that group has actually uh, stopped working because it was such internal struggle on these issues. But, but she told me that uh, we... Uh, we uh, embrace the heteronorm. Our only problem is that we don't fit into that norm uh, and we need help to, to sort of handle that. But she also said, we can't even be in the same room as the LGBTQ movement because they use our diagnosis, our medical diagnosis, uh, as license to, to push their ideological agenda. Very interesting to hear that from her. Uh, so they viewed this as two completely different things, the ideology and the diagnosis. And I think we should do so too. Um, but of course, there are people with this diagnosis that hold to the, that uh, uh, ideology too. Um, but um, uh, just as queer ideology, we can see here that, that, that this uh, perception of, of your gender uh, tends to make sexuality as something more fluid and your sexual identity as something more in your mind that is independent of your body, your reproductive organs, your chromosomes, your hormones. Um, and uh, trans has become a very big issue uh, the last few years, uh, particularly within our schools. Um, and and uh, I don't know really which countries are represented here, but, but I suppose most of us come from countries where this is <laughs> sort of a big issue. Um, it is definitely a big issue in, 
in Sweden and in the UK, but also in, in America. And I will get some examples from that soon. Uh, compared to other sexual minorities, for instance, people with a homosexual orientation, uh, there are a number of new challenges connected to, to the trans movement. Uh, and um, uh, one strong focus uh, for the trans movement have, has been uh, the access to bathrooms and change rooms, and, and many of you would have heard of this. Uh, I mean, a homosexual would not uh, normally have any sort of specific uh, wishes when it comes to that, uh, but, but uh, this is a big issue in the trans movement. Um, and another big issue that has come with this specific movement are the pronouns used to address a person. Uh, so, uh, for instance, should a teacher call a cute little girl by a boy's name because this person tells him or her that, that that's how you want to be called? Uh, or should the teacher refuse to do so with reference to, I mean, I see your biological sex and I, I want to use the no normal pronoun for that. Uh, many of you know Jordan Peterson in Canada who had taken quite a big fight on that issue. Uh, and um, uh, Jordan Peterson, by the way, he comes from Canada, and Canada have been very strong in these issues the last years. Uh, and I read a guideline from, um, it was the state of Alberta, uh, who published it a couple of years ago, guidelines for best practices. <clears throat> and, and it's very instructive to, to sort of get to understand this ideology. They start off by saying that self-identification is the sole measure of an individual's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. And I think this is a very interesting statement uh, because here we see the radical individualism in full bloom. Um, don't engage the doctors. Uh, don't engage the psychiatrists. It's only you who decide. No one else should have an opinion. And the school is sort of forced to, to, to just play along with what this student would say, or pupil. Um, later on in this uh, manual, they, they write about different pronouns that the teacher may need to use in the classroom, or also in official letters writing home to the parents. Um, and, and they say that some individuals may not feel included in the use of the pronouns he or she, and may prefer alter alternate pronouns such as the, zir, hir, they or them or might wish to express themselves or self-identify in other ways. Uh, for instance, MX instead of Mr., Mrs., etc. Uh, so to sort of, don't make any mistake, you could say dear MX in your letter to, to the, the adults at home, whoever they could happen to be. We have a similar um, guide in Sweden where they actually instruct the, the teachers to, to do that. Um, they said you could, speak to the, the adults back home. Uh, not parents, not mom or dad, but adults, because that sort of could be anything. And no one is hurt by that, they would say. Um, and that also shows a problem uh, that I, I see in this, um, because this is a minority's desire, but, but if you start to take away pronouns from, from all the others, I mean, if you have, in the same guide, they, they say that if if you come to class and you have 10 people looking like boys in front of you, you can't just say, hello, guys, uh, because someone there might self-identify as something else. And from a strictly minority point of view, that would sound liberating, but, but there is an oppressive thing here, because those who actually self-identify with their biological sex may have an interest in being called boys, in this case. So you take that away from the majority uh, to, to, to not... Uh, uh, disturb this minority. And it's the same with, with the adults at home. It may be my interest that my adults actually are called my parents, since they are my parents. Um, but uh, um, yeah, you get the picture uh, and the problems that could come with that. Uh, obviously, according to the same guidelines, uh, you cannot have a school uniform or dress code that makes it impossible for boys to wear skirts. Uh, you should also avoid sports or maths competitions where boys compete against girls. I don't know how common that is, but it says specifically that. Uh, and of course, the same with sexual education. Uh, 
Uh, you cannot split the class in boys and girls because that would give the idea that boys and girls may have different questions when it comes to sexual education. Um, and that is discriminatory in, in this way of thinking. Uh, but uh, all of this actually leads up to, to the, the thing that has caused most discussion, and that is the instruction with the bathrooms and change rooms. Uh, because they state here, students uh, are able to access washrooms that are congruent with their gender identity. And then they specify a student who objects to sharing a washroom or change room with a student who is trans or gender diverse is offered an alternative facility. This scenario also applies when a parent or other ca caregiver objects to shared washrooms or change room facilities on behalf of their child. <laughs> They're being very specific here. Uh, but in other words, uh, since you must not discriminate a minority, remember the lesson from intersectionality, intersectionality here, uh, if the girls who identify with their biological sex, and that would be the majority of course, if they have a problem with sharing change room with a boy not identifying with his biological sex, then it's the girls who identify as girls who need to leave. Because you can't discriminate the minority. And that of course creates quite absurd situations if it should be sort of pushed <laughs> a lot. Uh, and. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was a kind of law that, that, that was uh, imposed on the American schools by the Obama administration, which caused a, a great storm. Uh, and uh, you can say whatever you want about Donald Trump, I'm not getting into that, but that was one of the first rules or laws that he took away. Um, and it somehow illustrates what kinds of tensions we are dealing with here, with, um, uh, with an elite thinking in a specific way about all these issues but quite a lot of people on the ground that don't really follow and don't want to follow. Uh, going back to Sweden, uh, we seem to be more influenced by queer theory than transgenderism at the moment. Uh, I talked to Peter Linus at the uh, Evangelical Alliance of, of the UK, and his theory that's, uh, was that uh, uh, Sweden has come so far when it comes to LGB issues that we sort of don't need the T as much uh, to, to um, uh, open up for the whole LGBTQ uh, uh, sort of uh, movement or whatever. Uh, that is an, one theory because Sweden is very liberal in these aspects, so we don't really need the T as much for, for the sake of the whole. But then instead we have gotten into the queer uh, ideology. Uh, and I just made a, a, a brief uh, overview of, of the, the laws uh, of Sweden con concerning these issues, just to give you an idea of, of the development. As one of the first countries, we got the law of, of um, uh, partnership for same-sex couples in 1995. And then in 2003, uh, uh, same-sex couples were allowed to be tried for adoption uh, 2005, lesbian couples were given the right to artificial insemination in public hospitals, that is on the taxpayer's uh, expense. Uh, the Swedish Lutheran Church was also quite quick to, to adapt to this uh, way of thinking, uh, deciding to bless registered partnerships in, in 2005. Uh, but then we got a new marriage law that made uh, marriage gender neutral and the Swedish Lutheran Church actually changed its definition almost immediately after that. Uh, so now the latest issues have been about trans, that, that uh, there is no longer a demand for sterilization before sex reassignment surgery. Uh, so you can actually be sexually reassigned as your opposite sex, but still be able to, to have children from your born sex. Uh, we also have a decision that all parishes, local parishes in the Swedish church should be LGB certified by the church board. Uh, and just a year ago or so, a single woman uh, have the right to artificial insemination at public hospitals, uh, which is not an LGBTQ issue really, but it shows that you, just as we read in the school materials really, uh, section and children and those things, uh, live their own lives 
not related to one another. Uh, but what has happened in recent years uh, is that queer theory has been increasingly important also in the way that Swedish schools uh, and even preschools uh, work with issues uh, around equality, discrimination, anti-bullying. And I think I'll give you some examples of that before, uh, if, if there are more questions. Because at the end I also want to give some more of a, a Christian perspective on this. Um, and um, uh, now we get back to this norm critical pedagogy <laughs> uh, again. Um, because uh, the focus of, from the LGBTQ movement in Sweden has been very much to, to normalize homosexuality. Uh, and that in practice means that you say that uh, no sexual identity is more normal than the other. Uh, and therefore you also have this need to replace what would be called tolerance pedagogy with non-critical pedagogy. Uh, because um, what the non-critical pedagogy questions is the idea of normality uh, and presents, just like queer ideology, that sexuality is something fluid. Uh, to be tolerant would normally be a situation where a majority tolerates a minority. But already with, with that sort of thought figure, you. you somehow say that the, it is the majority that is more normal or at least sort of, yeah, in power would, would be the word from intersectionality. And, and queer ideology wants to break all those power uh, uh, relationships and um, especially all talk about normality. So, so these people actually hate the word tolerance and that is quite, you know, the first time you realize that is what? <laughs> because I've been taught that tolerance is <laughs> one of the most important words in the postmodern culture. Uh, we should tolerate everyone. Not so in the queer uh, movement um, and not so in Swedish schools at the moment uh, because tolerance itself is a shadow from the past uh, where we still thought that there were differences that had some kind of value in, in them. Um, and I read uh, this document from the Swedish government, uh, the, the public authority working against discrimination. Uh, they sent a, a document to all Swedish preschools that includes uh, these instructions. I will read a couple of them for you. If you are planning for separate activities for boys and girls, think it through. Be aware of the fact that it can contribute to upholding and strengthening the two-sex norm and create a risk for children to experience the method of working as unfair or offensive. Make sure there are gender neutral bathrooms so that children don't need to choose between the girls and boys toilets. Uh, I think this is interesting. I mean, there might be good reasons not to separate boys and girls more than necessary. I, I can see that. There, there are situations where that would be very unnecessary. Uh, but the point here is not that. Uh, the point here as is that um, uh, they want to erase the two sex norm. Why should you not split into boys and girls? Well, because then you say that that stands for something, that you are a boy and then a girl. Why do you have gender neutral bathrooms? Because you must not tell these four or five year olds that their gender identity has something to do with who they are because they are free to choose. Um, so that's how you see the queer ideology behind these kinds of instructions. And this is the Swedish state speaking. The preschool can advance children's equal rights and possibilities irrespective of sexual orientation by making sure that issues concerning homo, bi and heterosexuality are equally treated and integrated uh, in the activity. To embrace and make different family structures visible, it is a prerequisite of every child a being able to feel pride uh, of one's own family. A concrete effort is to make sure that the preschool has children's books about rainbow families. And rainbow families is families with uh, not just mom and dad and children, but basically anything else. Uh, it's a broad term, at least in Sweden. And these are quite strong words. I'm, I'm, since I'm a, an author, I, I look at words <laughs> uh, to be uh, uh, these issues and note the, the, the order, homo, bi, and heterosexuality. That's the order. They should be equally treated and integrated in the activity. 
Uh, well, that means that every second time you play mom and dad, and every second time mom and mom, or every third time rather, because you have dad and dad, and whatever else. Uh, these are quite strong words. And of course, everyone don't take them as seriously, but, but this is actually what, what the state tells uh, workers in preschools to do. And here's one, one last example from, from this guide. Uh, the staff should look over if the activity is marked by the heteronorm, that is, that the starting point is that people are heterosexuals. Uh, a promoting effort is, for instance, not to speculate if Karen and Mohammed, three years old, have taken a liking to each other and are a couple in the making. Now you can once again say that, hey, it's quite unnecessary to start speculating in, in who would be a future couple. Fine, that's one, one thing. Uh, but that's not the issue, really. They say that you cannot even tell three-year-olds that it could be so that you fall in love with someone of the opposite sex. Because then you are program, programming them in, uh, into the heteronorm. That is very strong, in my opinion. Um, and I could give more examples. I've written a book on this, but, but uh, it's in Swedish, so it won't help most of you. Uh, but uh, but that, that's where this research also comes from. And I could say something about my, my worries when it comes to this. And, and uh, I would say um, uh, the psychological ill health of the young generation is escalating, uh, in, not least in Sweden. Uh, and, and Sweden being one of the most sort of materially wealthy countries in the world and, and people having it very well, <laughs> basically, uh, this is uh, something that, uh, that has surprised many, that the psychological ill health is, is so, so high in, in Sweden. Uh, I know it's, it's bad in, in other Nordic countries too, but I think it's worse in, in Sweden, actually. Uh, and, and my theory is simply that people don't thrive in an environment where everything is floating. Uh, I think that that does something to you and people don't feel well in that kind of environment. Uh, and that is one big worry with this ideology, with talking about everything as fluid. Uh, I also would say that it's an encroachment on the young generation not to let them be proud of their biological sex. Um, because what I think is that uh, there will always be minorities that had a, a tough upbringing or a tough travel in life uh, and, and that's also one reason we should, should meet these sexual minorities with, with respect and with love. We should do so with anyone but, but not least those who have had that tough, uh, tough uh, journey. Um, what happens here though is that you sort of force that journey on everyone. Mm -hmm. Not just uh, this minority but everyone should have it. Since no one can look in the mirror and say hey well that's probably me. <laughs> Everyone should invent themselves, and I think that is, that's an encroachment on the young generation. Uh, it also opens up to sexual experimentation that I think will cause a lot of problems. Because when you've had five boyfriends and five girlfriends, you may have quite a bit of luggage to carry. Uh, and, and I simply don't wish that for anyone. Uh, but if you say the heteronorm is oppressive, that is, the whole market is open. And you also take away the love norm, which also some of these school materials do. You don't need to, to, to say that you should be in love with the person you have sex with. Then basically everyone who's not already someone else's partners, maybe even that, uh, is a potential sex partner. No matter of sex, no matter of feelings. Of course that will cause fluidity and, and a lack of boundaries that make people feel really, really bad in the end. So I'm, I'm very worried about the young generation uh, when it comes to this. Uh, I would like to say, of course, something about the, the Christian perspective on this. Uh, and that I could do so for a long time, but, but to make it a, a bit quick, um, it's quite obvious that the two sex norm is very foundational in scriptures. We see it already in the creation account. Um, uh, and, and this is not only uh, when it comes to male and female that you read about there, but it also uh, applies to the whole creation. Uh, and I, I noted Genesis 8 verse 22. Uh, it's after the flood where God says that as long as the earth endures, 
Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God is a God of order and actually of binary opposites. He separates land and water. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know the creation account. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a strong part of the, the, the creation code uh, that, that uh, is questioned in the queer ideology. Uh, I would still also give credit to queer ideology in, in one way that, uh, well, there is a point here that our identity is not fixed. Uh, we do become also in relation with others. Uh, other people, our parents, normally at first, and, and also in relationship with God. That's our, our belief. Um, and uh, no one is completely whole in his or her identity. I also, also think that is important for us to, to, to be clear on as Christians. Uh, God does point to heterosexuality and, and to, to man and woman being joined in marriage. And that is applicable also after the fall. Uh, but the fall has uh, affected our identity and our sexuality. So no one of us is sort of a perfect uh, sort of, what do you say? <laughs> perfect sample. And I, no, I didn't mention maybe, but I was thinking about Romans 8, verse 22 and 23. The whole creation groans. Uh, so we should give the queer ideologies that. We, we, we are all, in that sense, affected by the fall. The difference, of course, is that the queer ideologist would make that the new norm. And I would say that that is something that is broken. Uh, but we should, should um, also be humble here uh, in recognizing that. And of course, I think it is impossible uh, to neglect our basic biology. Uh, just to make some points, man and woman are both needed for procreation. Uh, and also the complementarity between the sexes is something that is important in both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, we also see in the New Testament that the apostles sometimes speak to men and women as separate groups, sort of recognizing that this is, these are two distinct groups. Um, it is also together that men and women are created in the image of God. That is also something that we should remind ourselves of. Uh, uh, there is something in, in male and female together that, that uh, makes us the image bearers of God. Uh, I would also say, and this is a critique of, of some parts of feminism also, is that equality is not dependent upon similarity. Because there is a thought figure here that uh, we need to be similar, otherwise we, we can't be equal. I think we need to challenge that, uh, that idea. Uh, and uh, God is uh, uh, creative when it comes to, to these things. Um, and queer theory also neglects central aspects of biological and psychological research. Uh, and that is also something that has become very clear to me when I have read these papers and, and, and books, that uh, the interest in, in actual research and scientific data is very low. <laughs> To put it simple, uh, it's a lot of preaching, but not very much sort of interest in, in, in science. And that's why I call it an ideology and nothing else. Uh, and as I said, there are also people within the LGBTQ movement that don't hold to that ideology. And we, we need to, to remind ourselves of that. Um, then, as I think I mentioned too earlier, is that um, the pattern of self-identification uh, that, uh, that reminds us of the foundational story of the fall, uh, where Adam and Eve wanted the privilege to define right and wrong apart from their relationship with God. Uh, and to me, Romans 1 has also become a very important chapter in the Bible here. Uh, and I have come to, to think of sexuality also as, you know, like an ecosystem. Uh, if, if one species is taken out of this ecosystem, it, it may affect the whole. Uh, I think that the heteronorm is, is such an aspect that when we put up, take out the heteronorm out of creation, uh, it's not just the heteronorm, it's something that affects the whole system. And I think all these uh, new letters, LGBTQI, etc. Facebook has 70 different um, gender identities to choose between. Uh, that tells me something of this is running out of control. 
we have put out something foundational and everything sort of collapses. Uh, and, and that also leads me to the final uh, thing here about Gnosticism. Someone mentioned it also. Uh, that, that theologically speaking, this is to me a form of Gnosticism, uh, where the created order is made a problem to overcome, not something to embrace. Your gender, your sex, sexual identity is not uh, something that helps you define yourself, but rather something you should overcome to define yourself on your own, uh, apart from creation. Well, that is Gnosticism, just in, in a new form.